All right, welcome to the show today. Today we're gonna to be talking about how to be a respected and successful leader. We have with us Mr. Scott Monty. He is a communications and leadership advisor. Um, he's the author of the Timeless and Timely Newsletter and also the host of Timeless Leadership Podcast. Mr. Scott, welcome to the show. Thank you, sir. Glad to be with you. So tell us, you know, um, I have a lot of people in the leadership field that comes on the show. Um, they always give us great nuggets. What got you into this role as becoming a great leader and communicator advisor, if you will? Well, I think part of it is uh, the people I've been lucky enough to be around in my career. Um, before I uh, branched out on my own about seven years ago, I was with Ford Motor Company for about six years, where I headed up uh, digital communications and social media at a global level. And this was back in mid-2008. And if you remember the market around mid-2008, that was when the whole financial meltdown started happening and the automotive, uh, as we like to call it, carpocalypse uh, began to happen. And Ford Motor Company was right in the middle of that. And we had a really um, a strenuous job at the time. It was basically six months of sustained crisis communications. And Ford was different because unlike the other two US automakers, we didn't need uh, that big bailout loan that the government gave. Um, but we did stand up with the other two, GM and Chrysler at the time, to say how important it was for the United States to get behind manufacturing. And that was part of what we were doing is fighting for the heart and soul of manufacturing in the United States. And in doing so, we gave ourselves an opportunity to differentiate ourselves from the others, even though we had been known as being part of the quote unquote big three for a long time. Uh, it gave us a chance to stand up and say we're different and to tell our story. And in those short six years that I was with Ford, I had a, an entire career's worth of education on communications and leadership. Um, and, and the leadership came primarily from Alan Mulally, who was the CEO of Ford at the time, one of the most respected leaders of the last 50 years in business. He served for Boeing for 37 years and then came to serve at Ford. And he taught all of us so much about the power of working together, about the power of, uh, of, of servant leadership, which was a kind of a new concept to me at the time, but it became very apparent what it was, and, and the power of humility in leadership. And I thought that, you know, this was a very different way of looking at leadership from a company that, you know, has been atop the minds of uh, not just Americans, but global citizens since the early 1900s. So it was really a, an inspirational way to start thinking about communication and leadership a little differently for me. So then you have, you, you've been across some of these great leaders. Um, in your opinion, what is a great leader? Well, a, a great leader, and I, I say this uh, on my, my podcast, is someone who inspires you to, uh, to do more, to act more, to be more, and to become more. It, it's about inspiring the best in other people. And we see leaders do that in a variety of different ways. There are certainly leaders out there, or maybe bosses, as we refer to them, who will uh, cajole you and hound you and uh, bark at you in order to get you to do things. And I think all that does is it meets the immediate deliverables of the day or the week or the month. It doesn't really do anything to build the character of an individual. It doesn't do anything to make them bring their best self to work. And I think that's what a leader does. It's when they are reflective on their own uh, time and can understand where some flaws may be in how they act. It's when they take the time to understand other people and understand their motivations in order to get the most out of them. And it, it's, it's where they actually step up and, as I said, serve first, rather than uh, act like someone whose orders need to be followed. And, and, and again, that gets into that, that role of servant leadership and the, the notion of, um, of doing first rather than waiting for others to do to you. 
Um, and, and to me, one of the most powerful things that Alan ever said to me is how important it is to understand first than to try to be understood, right? To seek understanding of others. Because everybody out there is so fixed on getting their point across and making sure you understand them. Well, if you just step back and listen for a little bit and hear what people are saying, it will make them feel heard. It will make them feel validated. And what that does is it brings human dignity to the conversation. And when we acknowledge someone else's dignity, that is really the core of leader humility. And interestingly, by honoring others, it makes them want to honor you even more as a good leader. It's, it's just interesting how that works. And you don't do it for the sake of trying to become a more honored leader. You do it because it's the right thing to do for another person, right? And acknowledging the other person as an actual person, not as a cog in the system or as a number in an assembly line, but as a real human being. And I think what we've experienced, particularly over the last year with respect to uh, the pandemic, uh, a lot of people out of work, a lot of people struggling, they want to be seen. They want to be seen for the struggles they're having. They want to be seen as someone who has uh, valid concerns and who may have a different way of thinking about things or a different way of bringing themselves to the job. And the more we can acknowledge that and give people a sense that they are a vital part of our team and are unique in everything they do, uh, I think the more they will bring themselves to the job. That's really so awesome. So you know, you talk about the, um, the timeless principle um, a lot. Um, tell us what is the importance of the timeless principle, of understanding actually the timeless principle? So um, when I talk about uh, timeless principles, I'm, I've got, well, just to back up a little bit, um, as an undergraduate in college, I was a classics major. I studied ancient and Greek uh, history and philosophy and uh, uh, architecture and art and literature and all that. And what it made me realize over time is that we humans are incredibly consistent in what we do. Yeah, the technology may be different today, the way we interact with each other, but when we do interact with each other, we're still pretty much the same people we've been for thousands and thousands of years, right? We still want what's in it for us. Uh, we want to contribute to uh, something bigger than ourselves. And, and we, we look out for the people that we care about. Right? And in, in some cases, it may be our family, it may be our team members, it may be just ourselves. And if you can acknowledge those truths, then it's, it, it, that helps you get ahead, right? And in, in thinking about what some timeless virtues are, you know, I looked back to the, uh, the ancient Greek philosophers, and they actually had 10 key virtues uh, that were uh, said to be the most essential in, in all humans, right? not just leaders, but I think if we can have leaders that display these virtues, these principles, uh, then we'll be better off. And those 10 virtues are humility. We've been talking about that already. Wisdom, justice, fortitude, or resilience, self-control, love, positivity, hard work, integrity, and gratitude. And if those sound like some things that maybe your grandmother taught you about when you were a little kid, and, and let's remember our grandmothers, everybody had a grandmother who says, you have two ears and one mouth, use them in that proportion, right? That's actually something that Socrates said 3,000 years ago. Right, we have been given two ears and one mouth. It is best to use them in such a proportion. That gets down to listening, right? We have so many leaders who simply want to step up and be heard. And once again, I just I just mentioned this: listening to other people and understanding them first is critical, right? So it's these these fundamentals of the human existence that, especially in the age of artificial intelligence and automated everything are even more valuable because we seem to be moving away from some of those. You know, that's, a, that's so true. So out of those, the, those, those great principles that you listed, what do you think is the greatest of all of those 
that makes or pans out a great leader? Well, that's, that's really tough. Um, Yeah, and it seems to me there's uh, some line in the Bible where somebody was asking Jesus about what, you know, what's the most important commandment? Love. He said love. He said love. Love your neighbor, love your parents, right? Um, said, yeah. and, and that's the golden rule, right? Treat other people the way you wish to be treated. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what could be, and, and it seems odd, right, to be talking about love with respect to leadership, but um, what is what is love but an expression of how we feel about each other, how we value each other, right? And I think we can show how we value each other at work just as we can show how we value each other at home. And it comes with bringing your best self to the job, um, lifting other people up rather than putting them down, um, approaching life with a sense of having fun but not necessarily having fun at someone else's expense. But I, I think about, it, it's interesting, I think about leadership and, and I think about leaders who have great senses of humor. They tend to be the ones who are able to poke fun at themselves first and foremost. And you know if they can laugh about themselves that they don't have such a thick skin, right? And, and they encourage other people to take that kind of uh, lighthearted approach to work. Not, not that people aren't serious about the work that they do, but that they take a, a more lighthearted approach. And when a leader exhibits that, I think that's their way of saying um, they accept themselves for who they are and they will accept you for who you are as well. That's awesome. What do you think uh, happens when leaders don't really apply these principles? Well, I, I think it becomes very apparent to those who are working for them. Um, and people find a way to survive in these kinds of situations. They manage. Uh, maybe they manage around it. Uh, maybe they manage to just kind of power through it and not let it bother them so much. But um, ultimately, I think people will move away from that kind of behavior. When we, it, especially, if, let, let's just kind of draw a line here. There's a difference between not showing those values and showing the negative of those values, right? Um, uh, so for example, instead of wisdom, they show ignorance every day. And it, just instead of showing a lack of wisdom, okay? Um, and that brings to mind a, a book of a, a very good friend of mine called Be the Sun, Not the Salt by Harry Cohen. And, and he talks about the power of heliotropic leadership. Uh, heliotropic meaning uh, the power of the sun. And you think about how sunflowers act. If you've ever been out in a sunflower field or seen some sunflowers growing on the side of a house, you'll see that in the beginning of the day, the sunflowers are droopy. And as the sun comes up, that sunflower will actually track the, the path of the sun across the sky right? And when we have leaders who bring the sunshine to work every day, who are uplifting and have a sense of humor and are willing to listen to us and acknowledge us, people are attracted to leaders like that. When you have other leaders who are uh, full of put downs and who bark commands and who are negative about the competition or about each other, what does that do? Well, that's like putting salt on the roots of a plant. And what does that do? It makes the plant dry up. And the same kind of thing happens with respect to human behavior. When you exhibit positive behaviors, people wanna be around you. When you smile, what's the first thing somebody else does? They probably smile back at you because they see you smiling. It's a wonderfully inviting and simple gesture. And if we take the time to just do some of these things that we learned when we were kids, right? That really aren't rocket science. None of this stuff is rocket science. It just takes time to focus on doing this because, well, maybe we've, we picked up some bad habits around the, uh, along the way, or maybe we surrounded ourselves with the wrong kinds of people, right? Uh, I'm, I'm sure, um, you know, maybe, maybe your grandparents said you're judged by the company you keep. I know that's something George Washington 
uh, wrote years ago. He had this this book of 110 um, virtues uh, that he expected, and it was kind of some arcane stuff about you know like uh, you know not looking in your handkerchief after you blow your nose or chewing with your uh, mouth open, stuff like that. But there were also some other things in there. One was about your reputation being judged on who you keep company with. And it's the same kind of thing. If you're colored by the people that you surround with and they're negative, you may come off as negative as well. That is so true. The, the, today, I feel like I'm back in my humanities class. Uh, listen to the great philosophy of the times. Uh, I love that class, by the way. Got to end that class. It was like I was geeking out. So there are great communicators uh, when we have leaders um, and some of our horrible communicators. What are some improvement strategies um, and disregard uh, for communications? Well, to me, I think some of the best communicators are storytellers, people who understand how to get your attention, um, how to move you along through a story, and how to help you understand the lesson at the end of it. Uh, that, that's one of the great wonders of you know, an ancient like Aesop, you know, everybody knows Aesop's fables. And they're, you know, they're a couple of paragraphs long, whether it's the tortoise and the hare, or uh, the fox and the sour grapes, you know, these are almost shorthand now. Um, but they're, they're told in such a way that they connect with us emotionally. And this is what great communicators do. They connect with us emotionally, right? They, they uh, provide some kind of vessel for information uh, so the story, whether it takes the form of an audio podcast or a video or even a white paper, these are ways to get points across. Um, and ultimately, um, what are stories, but the things we tell ourselves about ourselves. And the great communicators are able to, uh, to get that information across in a succinct and emotional way and to do it in as... Um, uh, entertaining a way possible. And for me, you know, I always stick to the rule of three. You know, they, three is, is supposedly this magic number, but this is pretty much what the human mind can easily uh, remember. And when you group things in threes, um, it's, it's, I mean, look, it, you go back to the Holy Trinity. Uh, at Ford, we had uh, cars, trucks, and uh, and, and SUV, small, medium, and large. Um, you know, there, there were simple shortcuts in threes that we could all roll off, the, uh, off of our tongues without too much trouble. So if, if you remember how the mind works, and if you're able to connect to people emotionally and tell a story, I think those are some of the greatest communications things to, uh, to keep in mind. That is so, that is so, so true. But now, how can leaders uh, of today change the future? Well, this is interesting because I, I just had a conversation uh, a couple of weeks ago on my show with uh, the leadership and management guru of the last four decades, Tom Peters. And he talked, he's been talking about excellence for 43 years. And really it's not, excellence isn't a journey, according to him, or isn't a destination, it's a journey. And uh, I, I was just replaying this in my mind. He said, excellence is, and, and you talk about the future, um, excellence is the next five minutes, right? There's all kinds of people who are trying to think of, well, how do we get to the end of the quarter? How do we get to the end of the year? How do we plan for the next five years, 10 years, 30 years? He said, you know what? You need to worry about the next five minutes. The, the, the person who's in front of you right now, what kind of attention are you giving them? When the meeting gets out and somebody you see in the meeting has had kind of an off time, maybe they gave a presentation that didn't go well. Maybe they've got a scowling look on their faces. Other people have been talking. If you pull them aside in the hallway for a couple of minutes and ask them, about what's going on in their life. Those five minutes are the most critical five minutes in how you get to the future. Because together, this is, together we, we, we take this trip into the future. Regardless of what uh, technology looks like or our planning process, we are marching into the future together. And working together is the most important aspect of leadership that there is. If you can't get people to work together to 
develop a plan, to communicate the plan, and to execute the plan, then there may as well be no plan, right? So it's really about how you spend the next five minutes. Wow, awesome. Mr. Scott, it's been a pleasure, a wealth of knowledge. My goodness. So tell us, you know, you're on, um, you have a newsletter, you're on podcast. If there's any other platforms where we can locate you and find you and learn more about you. Well, I am Scott Monty everywhere. Uh, if you want to look for me on all of the socials, you can find me at scottmonty.com and subscribe to the podcast and the newsletter through my site there. All right. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Thank you for joining us. All right. Thank you. All right. Ness IBS.